nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Helen. <laughs> uh, my surname's Dibble and the business is incredible. I've been freelance since 2013 and I was more clueless than the 1995 smash hit when I went freelance. I was in marketing. I was in-house marketing, so I was never a Fianna and I never did that agency um, scale with my career to sort of learn things that I might have done at the board table or the um, <laughs> where, the, where strategy is done. None of that stuff happened. I wanted to write. Um, a few things about me outside of that. I've been, since I started this, I've always wanted to do training and coaching. Um, super close to my sister. If I wasn't in lockdown, she's six hours away from it at the moment. We'd be spending a lot more time together. I love traveling and it was traveling when I was first paid to write. Um, I'm a country bumpkin and I met my boyfriend because I bought his house. So that's a lovely little story for you that I'll go into some other time. So over that time, despite being completely clueless, I somehow managed to build a freelance copywriting career, learning and learning as I went. And in, it was 2016, I started building a freelance agency. 2017, it really took off. And today I mentor and coach freelancers to help them run their own happy and profitable, profitable businesses. And I still run my lovely, lovely agency, Incredible. Okay, back to you guys. We're talking about pricing today and I wanna know how it feels to you because when I started in 2013, it was like drinking arsenic with Hades. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Maybe you're totally chill about it. So let me understand for a moment. I wanna get a, a sort of a, a sense of how you're feeling. <laughs> drinking arsenic with Hades, boom, straight in there with five of you. Okay, let's see where we come. is useful i like that we get the, the answer the final answer but we also see the curve very useful peter can you remind me how many people we have in in the session today we have 55 yeah 55 okay so 41 of you responded the rest of you might be eating your sandwiches 42 there we go okay so 3.8 so on average most of you find it average to pretty uncomfortable and you're not alone that's how i found it too um okay and just this is the work this is the stuff we're going to focus on today so I want to these are the challenges that most freelancers talk to me about the most and I'd love to hear from you what your biggest challenge is so is it figuring out the budget is it asking the client how much have you got is it actually pricing what you do so you might know what the budget is but you get you stumble over actually pricing the elements of work that you're going to do are you broke is it that you're not charging enough is it that you're increasing, is it increasing your fees, particularly mid-contract? Project creep and scope is the last one. Okay. Okay, pricing what I do is strong, strong leader there. Okay, that's 42 of you. I think that's the most, I think that's everybody responded. Lovely. So we're gonna do things in that order, guys. We're gonna go pricing number one. We're gonna go budget number two. Project scope number three not charging enough, number four, and five, increasing fees. Hopefully we'll be within time to cover all of those off Q&A at the end. You ready? Let's go. Okay, so excuse me while I skip through this. Oh, I do want to tell you some other things first. Let's Before, before we go into that, two things I didn't know when I started, and I still had to remind myself about now. Setting your fees is actually very little to do with your talent. It has to do with a whole load of other things that we're going to explore today. And you also, if you are one of those first starting off, you've got less than three years experience, you don't have to work your way up to feel fees you feel good about. Um, there can be things you do today that make you feel really valued and important part of your client's work. Um, you don't have to wait until you've been doing this for 10 years to get that. You don't deserve to. I also want to tell you about my pricing journey. So when I started, I charged, and I'm really, really sorry, I charged 20 pounds for a blog. This was in 2013, 20 pounds for a blog. Um, I hadn't got a clue. I, I, you know what? When I was in New Zealand, I was first paid to write, and I said I charged thirty pounds for a blog, thirty dollars for a blog. I thought, well, half of that is fifteen English pounds. I'll add five pounds. That's all I did. 
and not surprisingly I was really broke and I was didn't know what I was doing freelancing for for quite a while until I realized my mom once said to me I'd put a zero on the end she was right um the next sort of part of my journey is arguing point blank with my business coach having a proper tantrum because I believe there was a ceiling price to my industry I was charging 65 pounds for an article what was I thinking so all the things that we can believe around money today I run a six figure a six figure business <laughs> and I get really frustrated when I see those things put around everywhere uh, and six figures does a little glory stats it means nothing um six figure business they say revenue is glory uh profit is oh, there's a lovely phrase that I'm not going to be able to remember uh, cash is king. I'll come back to that. There's a really good one, but revenue is basically glorious stats. Vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. So your revenue, when somebody's throwing around, oh, I run a seven figure business, six figure, five figure business, absolute vanity. And actually, I don't personally earn six figures. I am comfortable. Um, but I think that there's a misconception. Don't talk about this enough. So people get a real, really clear idea of what pricing, good pricing means and makes sense for individuals. The other thing I want to tell you about is something that I heard just last week. There's somebody in Europe charging $3 per word and keeping the IP. And there I was thinking there was a, a ceiling price on £65 for an article. Um, I heard last night uh, that one of my freelancers was in a group and a marketing agency was paying 20 to 25 pounds for an article forgive me that this is very writing centric um i'd love to hear what it's like in other industries but that's certainly undercutting the market and um really needs to be stamped out <laughs> so anything you can do to do that that helps the helps the pledge the other thing i want to say is that mindset is everything price is deeply deeply subjective um you could spend half a million to buy a house in dublin you could spend half a million and get a castle and coven. And you, depending on who you are, that might be your absolute dream come true, or it might be a nightmare, certainly not a city dweller. Um, the other thing is, as I've said, the glory figures, the revenue, it tells you very little about what's really important. So when you're hearing a lot of competition out there talking about how much they're earning and what they're charging, actually it tells you very little about the quality of life, the job satisfaction or the profit margin. Um, Dan Pink in his book Drive, he says that nobody really gets into entrepreneurship to make money. It's all about mastery, autonomy um, and uh, going your own way, which I know all freelancers want to do. So I would urge you to set your own boundaries and build your own barometer of success. So how many hours do you want to work? We'll talk about some of this later. Um, what do you want to earn? What do you need to earn? And what does that look like for you? The only thing I would say that are, two, there are no rules around how this is done. And I think that was one of my biggest misconceptions that I thought there were loads of rules and I didn't know what they were, all these secrets around pricing. And there aren't any rules, you can do it your own way, except these two, please try not to undercut your market and reduce the gender pay gap. Now this is a really interesting one. Um, it's a big topic, but I do want to touch on it. 43% gender pay gap in self-employment. That's huge. It's really interesting. And um, Peter, I'm going to refer to you here because you've got some interesting stats of your own, which are actually quite positive and optimistic, I think. You want me to uh, quote them now? Tell I'd love you to, if you don't mind, just please. Yeah, so we did a bit of analysis of our own database. We have about 60 writers on our database um, as part of the Indie list. And the average across the, uh, the full list is 330 euro per day is the average. Now, clearly that varies depending on people's level of experience. Um, and I won't go through the levels of experience, but you know, they, it does vary quite a bit. But then between males and females, there's an 8% gap in favor of males. So um, yes, it's not, it's not as high as the figure, but 8% uh, 8, 8 gap is there nonetheless, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 8% gap, let's one day hope that it gets to zero. I think this is a really loaded topic because there are so many reasons and different, different, I think women might go sometimes go into freelancing for different reasons, but maybe there is also something going on there. Like I say, if this gives anybody um, a little bit of confidence in the pricing, then happy days, happy days. Okay, so your challenges, let's have a recap on them. So we're gonna go to pricing first, which is the second slide. So excuse me when I dance to it. Here we go. Okay, pricing your services. So typically for me, pricing my services took me ages. It felt like it was a, a drain on my resources that I would spend ages figuring this out. I would agonize over it and um, it would leave me feeling really frustrated. The aim of this is to reduce the agony. Use spreadsheets with simple formulas. 
that is my best advice to you. Spreadsheets with simple formulas. I create a fee calcula calculator for every single client or prospect that I start talking to. The easiest way to do this, although I really believe in charging for value, is actually to start with time because it's easy, right? <laughs> so you take your day rate and I will talk to you about how to... It would take you to do a job. The way I do this is I go, okay, management consultants, management fee, because it takes time for you to do this proposal, for me to talk to you on the phone. There's going to be client liaison probably, so that should go in there too. Um, there's the actual work. For me, that's writing, but it could also include free reading, um, editing. Am I going to do it? Somebody else going to do it? Uh, what else? How many rounds of revisions are we going to have there? Does it need to be designed and do we need to proof it again afterwards? So all of these things add more time. I would look at a uh, value of time, ideally no more than half a day. I might go down to quarter of a day if I have to. Um, and I'd look at that. Now, because I've asked for the budget and we will come on to budget next, um, you can then have a look and you can adjust it for value and you can adjust it for uh, budget if you want to. But this, this means you know, regardless of budget, exactly how you should price things. So as I've said, absolutely bring in client management and liaison. And I'd recommend bringing in a 10 to 20% contingency as well to cover your ass because things always go wrong. <laughs> Um, or if they don't, well, hey, all right, you've made a little bit more margin in that month and that is super cool for you and you deserve to. So that's my, my, my process for doing it. Like I said, I create a fee calculator. When you've, when you've done it once, you literally just go in there and you're checking your numbers because you, you can, the more you practice this, the faster it becomes for you to figure this stuff out. Um, and then you're able to, you know, you're on the phone with a client, you're like, okay, I estimate it's probably going to be looking something like this and you're having your budget conversation. It's giving you more confidence. So that's my recommendation there. Just going to check in. Have we got anything in the chat at this moment that I should be aware of, Peter? No, all good. Yeah, people are all reacting good. really well. Yeah, super points, all super good. slides. Yeah, all very good. Super cool, super cool. Okay, so I'm going to take you now to budget. Okay, figuring out the budget. Number one solution, ask. And what do they say? I don't have a budget. Do they? Heck, they have a budget. They just don't know they have a budget. So your job is to figure out what that budget is. And here's a script to help you do it. So. Have you got a budget in mind for this piece of work? Oh no, not really. Okay, so if this came in between, and guys, these are arbitrary figures, like don't pay any attention to the, word, the numbers I'm actually saying. Um, so if this came in between maybe three and 5K, how would that feel? Oh no, that's, that's way more than I was thinking. Okay, so maybe it was like two to one to two, is that more? Oh, no. And so how, what? Okay, so then you are empowered to have a conversation that goes, I, I might not be the right freelancer for you. You could probably get it done for that price, but if you work with me, it's going to look like this. And because you have your pricing spreadsheet and you've already figured out, we'll work on the other stuff, so you already know what you should be charging, et cetera. You're able to have a really empowered conversation around this with, with who you're working, on, working with. You can also always say, I'll come back to you. And you can also have so much confidence in your fees that, that's simply what you're going to propose because you know you've got it right and you know you've, you're charging an amount that allows you to live, survive and thrive. Um, and you believe that there is an abundance of work that will come back to you. So yeah, that's the budget script works. Now it can be really tempting with a script <laughs> to say something like, so if it came in at over a million, would that be right? If you've got good rapport with the person you're speaking to, actually you're more likely to get a laugh rather than a good answer. So I really recommend you go in with a figure that you, you know is around about how much you'll charge for it. Um, they, there will be occasions when they go, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. And then you kick yourself because you haven't gone in high enough, but you learn and the next time you come back to it again. So I hope that's really useful. Right, that's pricing and budget, guys. I hope you're with me. I hope you're enjoying this and it's useful. I'm now oh, going to go to... Helen, sorry mm. to interrupt. Just a quick question from one of the, uh, the attendees just on that yeah. question of value. Uh, what do you mean by value, quantifying value? Quantifying value, really, really hard. <laughs> but I often think, okay, you need to ask the questions at briefing stage about how much money this is going to make the client. So if they are doing it, if it's urgent then there's value for you turning it around quickly. If it's gonna bring them a lot of money, then there's value in you doing it. Um, those are the biggest indicators that this is more than just a time, of, of an hour's pricing job. Um, 
I think also for the your amount of experience that you're bringing to it and the sophistication in which you're able to deliver it and the thinking you're able to do outside of the brief that elevates the entire project to make them think about other things they've never even thought about, that's value. So all of those things, and there's probably myriad, myriad more um, that will that will lead to that, um, right. that value piece. I hope that solves that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Perfect, yeah. Go, go. So awesome, awesome. Now, where are we going next? We're going to Project Creep. Doo, doo, doo. Okay, where's Project Creep? Here we go. Project Creep. Now I'm going to talk as if um, this is for new work coming in, uh, but we will be touching also on work that's sort of existing because I know often you're in the middle of stuff and the work's going out of control and you're like, I haven't quite it for this, what's going on? So at the beginning of the engagement, define the brief, confirm the brief. We often do what's called a copywriter's brief when we reflect back exactly what is meant to happen to the client and get them to sign it off. It's not a contract. We call it as part of our process, which is why I'm going to talk about that at the end. Um, but it really helps them get super clear. The other thing is conversations and contracts or terms. Uh, conversations, you, most, most big and good clients and agencies understand that you will charge more if it's outside of the scope of the brief. Those are the clients we want to attract. You can put in your terms or your contract, additional work is charged at this much per day or hour. Changes to the brief will or may incur additional charges. And you can use these clauses, guys. I actually interviewed a solicitor to get really, really clear on this for one of my, my programs. And that solicitor said, templates are meant to be adjusted. So take a template, take a clause. Um, it, they haven't been signed off by a solicitor, but I use them frequently. And the whole point of a template, if you're using them in your, in your contract, your terms, is that you adopt that you doctored them to make them work for you. Okay, so... Um, the other one which I quite like, should you wish to change the brief, you may be required to make an additional payment to cover work we've done. This will be based on the percentage completed. So that's covering you for what you've already done and work going forward. I would say that anytime a client brings that up, you need to get into the habit of having that, that conversation that goes, okay, so um, we probably need to revisit the brief or there's probably gonna be extra fees there. Are you comfortable with that? Um, most people just expect it, it does depend on your client. Um, but also manage their expectations right from the off. If you're in the middle of work um, and you're finding it's going off and <laughs> to have, if there are any questions at this point, you know, from somebody who's in the middle of a situation where the brief has blown, what's the situation? Because do you need to sort of rush in now with, hang on guys, we're not being paid for this or is it under control? Is there any feedback there, Peter? I'd love to know. No, not so far. No? Okay, guys. Well, I hope that helped. Cool. Uh, We're now going to... I don't pay myself enough. You're not charging enough, you're broke. Okay. You need to put up your fees. That is my number one piece of advice. Put up your fees. Um, and you also need to do your sums. So this is just a really basic rough run through of how to do that. And you hopefully you've already done this already, but it's a really smart idea to figure out, to start off with how much do you actually want to work this year? What do you want your, your year to look like? There are 252 working days in the UK, less weekends and bank holidays. You can Google that to get the figure for whatever country you're in. And how much holiday would you like? And how much sick leave would you like? I recommend at least two weeks sick because COVID, right? It's taught us a lot. You need two weeks to recover. <laughs> I was once sick in 2015, it wiped me out for a month. It was horrible to come back from that. So think about those things and how much holiday would you like? Do you wanna take a month off at Christmas? Do you wanna take a month off at Easter? What would you like to do? You also need to have a really clear idea of your monthly outgoings and how much you want to save. And when you've totted up all of that, you want to take your annual income target. So whatever it is for monthly and savings times it by 12, the number of days you want, and you divide that number by the number of days you want to work and you will get a day rate. Now you might realize that actually you only want to work, the, only, the, the days you bill are less than the days you're working. So you might be billing for two days and five. So you might want to adjust the number to that to make sense for you. But that will give you a day rate. Now, I immediately tell you, would recommend double it because then you can take care of your tax, your expenses, a little bit of contingency and or saving, and you're still covering your ass and making sure you're being paid enough. And that figure, the first time I looked at that figure, I was scared because it was so far away from my 60 pound per, 65 pounds per article that I was charging. But hopefully you're in a much healthier position than me and the stats that Peter shared earlier definitely look like you are. Uh, but if it's feeling intimidating, then take a deep breath and get some of these books that I've listed on the side. So Profit First, got them here. Got them here, guys. 
Profit First, phenomenal book. Really like it. Gives you a really simple formula for figuring this stuff out that will echo some of what I've told you today. I also recommend you look at Chillpreneur. This is for women more than men, but it's a very good book about uh, sort of like the freedom of working your own way. There's another good book called Company One you should read as well, guys. That's great. This is getting rave reviews um, from people all over the place. Survival Skills for Freelancer. That's written by a copywriter, so I'm quite aware of that one. That's a good one. Another book for women is Playing Big. That was a really good one about stepping into your space and owning it. And this one just arrived last week and I can't wait to read it. It's called Art for Money. And this is going to work across lots of different industries. Uh, lovely, light little book. It feels like the book I wish I'd written. Um, and it's published by Holloway. It's a publisher doing really cool things. So yeah, check that out. I think it looks really cool. And I hope that's useful for you guys. Reading around on this stuff really helps. So that is not enough. And now we're going to go to increasing fees. And which is number five, increasing your fees. Really different conversation when it's an agency to a client. An agency will often be locked into a retainer. So it's a difficult conversation or a different conversation to have them with a client. Again, we're going to go from that position of um, the aspirational position. So you're sort of beginning of a contract rather than mid contract. Um, but it is about conversations and contract terms. So we say something like in our terms, um, incredible increases its fees each year in line with market rate skills and expertise and inflation. You could also say something like incredible reserves the right to increase fees each quarter, 60 days, month, whatever you like, in line with market rates, skills and expertise or at our discretion. That's quite a nice one. Useful dates for introducing this. So if you are mid contract and you're not sure what to do, tomorrow is the 1st of April. It's the beginning of a new tax year uh, in the UK. So what can you do there <laughs> to increase your rates? Um, your own financial year, mine's in June, that could be another excuse and actually a new year. I was working with a copywriter, we weren't sure when the work was going to come in. He said, I'm 420, 19, and 2020, I'm going to be 450. I knew exactly where I was standing and actually as somebody who's playing that, uh, I'm playing the copywriter card and the agency card, when copywriters come to me with absolute clarity over how they charge, um, it makes it really easy for me. So that's been a really useful thing to experience and to see what it's like when somebody comes to me confidently. I also love it when somebody comes and says, it's usually this, but what have you got? What does your margin look like? And I'm like, okay, we can do it for that. Don't worry. <laughs> and we can have a conversation around it. That really helps. Um, that's all those different challenges gone through. And I hope that's really helped someone in some way. I also would like to just finish on the sexy, sexy process. And I promise you this is sexy, right? And I know it doesn't sound like it, but do you have a process that you share with your clients that explains how you work? This inspires confidence in your abilities. Not only like, this is what happens. So um, often clients need educating. Agencies, maybe not so much, but clients often don't know what it's like to work with you and they want to be taken on a ride. They want you to, they want to have an experience with you. So tell them what that experience is going to be like. And this is your chance to put in all your terms. So it goes, okay, so we, have, we decide the brief and we agree the terms and we fix it and we talk about the price and then you sign the contract and then we do this and then we do that and then you pay me and then you pay me again and then you pay me again and you can have the conversation as part of your process so your client right up front knows exactly what to expect and you can manage those expectations they're also sort of awash with a feeling of assurity they're in safe hands and I feel like it is it is such a simple thing that can position you as such a brilliant person to do business with. A lot of people will not come to me with it. And I'm like, well, I, I haven't worked with you before. I don't know what you want. Tell me what you need from me to do a good job. So it's very empowering. Um, and I really, really recommend you get yourself a process and you define it. Make sure you've got your payment terms in there as part of it uh, to wow your clients. And that is the thing that makes people buy you. So that's everything from me. I hope that was useful. Well, that's brilliant. Yeah, we've had a, a Good few questions along the way there since uh, the last one that I asked you there. There's, there's one in particular um, from a lady called Kiva, and I, I won't call her her, her full name, but anyway, Kiva started, she said, back in February uh, as a writer, and she was asked by a client to give a fee off the top of her head. And now the client is wanting to add more onto the brief. Um, there's no written contract or, or terms. Um, the client, he's, he or she says they're paying out of his pocket and describe my pay as a gift. The client doesn't want to send an official invoice. He doesn't want to pay that. Uh, all sounds a bit ropey, this. But anyway, any advice to, to somebody like that? 
Okay. Can I run stop a, sharing? Run a, besides run a million miles away. <laughs> Kiva, congratulations going freelance. It's super exciting and well done in securing your first client. The first thing I would say is that when you say goodbye to things that don't fit, it makes room for things that really, really do. Um, your, your payment is not a gift. It's what you deserve for delivering a brilliant service. And um, I would go back to him and, okay, you have a decision to make. So how important is the work to you compared to actually being paid your worth and finding, making room for other clients that are gonna pay you that and, and make it worthwhile. So there's a bit of a decision for you to make. And believe me, at the beginning, I had those clients where I was being paid pittance and I had to, when I said goodbye to them and I said my fees were going up, actually people start respecting you differently and you get the good work in. So it's really worthwhile doing. So I would recommend you need to have a conversation with him to either put up your fees and get, a ter get your terms in place, or you need to um, make that decision about whether you want to continue working with him or not. Um, there are good people out there who will pay you what you're worth. There's a question as well from, from Lorraine, uh, and she's asking about the use of the calculator, Helen, that you have. So is yeah. the same calculator for different types of work, you know, obviously the work that you as a, as a writer and the people that you use, um, you know, is going to vary quite a bit, but do you use different calculators or the basis of it presumably is still the same? I adapt them so I'll probably yeah so we've just done an employee engagement survey which I know doesn't sound anything like copywriting but there's a report to write and we have data analysts so it kind of works so we had to quickly quote for one and what I did was we've done similar work somewhere along the way I'll take that calculated copy and then adjust it my line items always have management fee they always have proofing and editing and they usually have it's a day rate that I put in along the line items um so I just go on day rate and then it doesn't matter if it's um, a proofer or a writer or a photographer, um, it all sort of tots up. So I hope that makes sense yep. and translates for you. Um, I'm just intrigued by, by the, the comments or at least the statement that you made that setting fees uh, has very little to do with your talent. Um, you know, clearly people who are freelancing or in the business longer, certainly based on, on our sample of, of 60 people that we have, um, you know, the more experienced people clearly are charging more, the more specialist people are charging more than the average, uh, and that's to be expected. But just maybe qualify uh, that, that uh, thought that you had. Yeah, I'm really glad. I really love that the right people, that those people are charging the right amount. That is absolutely brilliant. I think it's when you're at the other end of the spectrum, and um, there are people out there who are going to be charging more than you might be and doing a shit job. And actually the reason they're getting more is because they have the confidence, the goal to put themselves out there um, and charge that rate rather than actually necessarily the um, amount you're bringing in. Actually fee is often down to your client's budget and your the urgency, the importance of it to them. Um, yes, your talent does come into it, but there are so many other factors as well. And I hope that, I hope everyone understands I'm not doing a disservice to people who are super talented um, and they should be charging more. Yep, absolutely get that. Um, but I think there's also many, many other things that influence it. Um, the, the, the question or the statement that you made as well as part of the presentation, don't undercut your market. And I know that's a very difficult thing to do, particularly if people are under pressure. You know, we've all been in that situation where maybe it's been a fallow month or two or whatever. And, you know, as a freelancer, you get maybe tempted or panicked into, you know, pitching for business that maybe you wouldn't normally or lowering your rate to a level that you wouldn't normally do. What kind of advice would you give people in those situations? Yeah, so really good question. Thanks for asking it, Peter. Um, the beginning of the year, January and February for Incredible were barren. <laughs> we were really, really quiet. And uh, it's, it's the year has, has presented that to us. Um, and I was reminded by an agency friend when she said, what's your day rate again? And I told her my day rate and she said, I have it as 200 pounds more than that because I had gone in to scarcity mode. I had gone into that exactly as you described, Peter, that place when we often go, when we haven't got enough work on the table and we go, oh yeah, I better lower my rates. I don't feel too good about myself. So my advice is remember the feeling. Remember how it feels to charge your worth, put out those really good weights. Remember those fe that feeling of being abundant and having loads of work coming in and feeling really steady and grounded and having a really successful business. And if you haven't done that yet, imagine it because it's just as good. So remember that and put that energy when you declare your prices because it will help you um, have the confidence to put it out there. 
There's a, back to that question about scope creep. Um, again, there's a question here from Rory he says, how would you deal with a client who doesn't want to pay the extra, pay for the extra work out of the brief after delivery? So, you know, he's answered the brief and then more work comes along and then the client says, well, I'm not going to pay for that extra work. Difficult okay. situation. I'm um, sure most or many freelancers have found themselves in, in that particular boat. Yeah, Rory, I've walked away a couple of times, not been paid, definitely in the early years. Um, going forward, it's definitely about your contracts and your conversations. You can go to the small claims court. Um, I think that your chamber, the equivalent of your chamber of commerce should be able to give you advice and a solicitor will give you free advice for half an hour. So if you feel like you need to take it to a legal professional, do. Um, I think if you can get on the phone to your client and have a conversation about, there was some sense, I don't understand here, you know, very... Then if they are if they're being a bugger, that's one thing. If they're not, and we're trying to understand the, their innocence in it, what can you do to understand how has this mis misunderstanding happened? And that can be a really powerful place to come from when you're sort of on the phone to them going, I don't really understand. <laughs> what, you know, just help me understand because my, my perception was this is what we were creating. I never meant to mislead you and I'm sure you didn't either. So what was it from your, what was your expectation and what did your, you presume and what did I presume? And at least then you can have a cordial conversation to understand it rather than I think sometimes we can isolate ourselves and feel fury at these situations. So try and, try and have a conversation with them if you can. I think one of the things that we would say as the indie lists, you know, given that we now represent over 500 people in the market, I think in any, you know, we, we've done about 100 projects through the freelance community that we have since we started. And thankfully, we haven't certainly we haven't heard of any situations where our clients have abused, you know, that relationship. But what we would encourage people to do, you know, come to us. And we will try and use, obviously, our own good offices to try and put some pressure back on clients. To be fair, look, but, but I can't say that, that it's been a, an issue so far, but, you know, it's part and parcel of being part of, of the Indie List community is that we'll use as much of the muscle that we have as a collective to go back to clients or go back to agencies and say, look, guys, I don't think you're being entirely fair here. And we're more than happy to do that. So if any of you are kind of experiencing that, just t talk to myself and Una and we'll, we'll do our best. Um, and I think you're right about that scope creep thing as well, is, is just making sure, I think one of the things that I'm certainly picking up from you, Helen, is the recommendation around preparing a spec on what, what you're committing to do on behalf of the client before you actually engage to do the work, because that avoids that kind of scope creep and people saying, oh, look, will you, will you do something extra here? Will you write that extra white paper for me and you won't charge me more for that, will you? And I'm sure, we, again, we've all come, up, come across that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely define the brief. Um, it helps on so many different levels, especially if you're growing your agency and you need to brief somebody else. <laughs> that definitely yes, is a, yeah. a really yeah. crucial yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Like cl clearly a lot of the, the freelance people around the call today, they don't just rely on incredible, they don't just rely on the indie list to get work. Um, would you advise any any of the freelancers here here, here today to look for part payment up front or is that something that's a complete no-no um we know in certain situations where there's a lot of work involved particularly where there's a number of freelancers involved we're saying to clients you need to agree a payment schedule where you know maybe a third of the fee is agreed up front so that nobody is left in the lurch absolutely 100 percent, peter um the if it's a project particularly website projects because they can really spiral out of control and go way beyond the over time. I used to do 50% upfront, 50% on completion. I don't do that anymore. I do something like 25% upfront, then maybe or 40% upfront and then 30, 30. And it's not 30 on completion, it's 30 on month six or something like that. So we've gone month one, month three, month six um, within the original scoped amount of time. I had one client, luckily it was a really small job, but he didn't finish his website for a year. <laughs> which is waiting because we've done the majority of the work at that point so we think yes definitely a little bit up front particularly if it's a project if it's a retainer uh, you might want to get the first month up front if that suits you and your client um yes if it's avoid doing in if it's going to be a project that's that really spirals and website projects always do and you'll know in your own industry if there's something similar then 50 50 is not going to work make sure you have really agreed start, um, time payments and most people agree to it it should be fine. Um, you, you talk about contracts along the way, and I know uh, there's a question here from, from one of our attendees as well about that kind of embarrassment or slightly muddying the water with a contract or asking for a contract, particularly when you know the client, you've worked with them in the past. 
you know, again, what's the advice in those situations? Should you always look for a contract? Should you, again, I think if people are dealing through the indie list, we try and cover that off for them anyway, you know? Um, but what's your own view? Yeah. Yeah, this is a really interesting one because I push this home, get a motherfucking contract. <laughs> we really need them. But um, I've got a, a long standing two and a half year agreement, and that, that contract's long expired. And they, they're great payers. What I'm going to do is send across my terms. And this is, I think, a really lovely, gentle way of please look at my terms and agree to them by email me, emailing me back. Um, I used to use something called PandaDoc where you sort of go in and you click to sign. And I always do that with a new client because it sets out my terms in quite a lovely way. However, um, a full on contract is no longer, I, I feel like quite the right thing for these engagements and sending across your terms and saying, it, it's 2021, I've got new terms. Or it's a new financial year, it's a new tax year, I've got new terms. Um, please read these and um, I'll know you've read them because I need you to come back. I usually say mine that you've read them and agree to them that's a soft way to do it um, and I think it avoids the legal department because I've had clients not said can we not have a contract so it'll take ages to go through legal which I think is a, a bit of a fob off um, but yeah terms can be really useful I hope that helps yeah absolutely uh, there's a question which uh, I'm not sure if you can maybe put a UK perspective on it but uh, again from one of our copywriters who's been told by an agency looking for a freelancer that the day rate in Ireland for copywriting is fixed at 300 euros per day. I don't know where, where the agency might have got that one from, but anyway, uh, I'm putting myself out there saying, I don't think that's enough. What are people's thoughts on this? I, do, do, are you, have you any sense of what the UK, is there an average rate for kind of commercial copywriting in the UK? So Pro Copywriter surveys the average day rate across the UK every year. 2020, it was 342 pounds. Um, my average I, I often see coming in is about 350 for a middleweight copywriter and up. Um, we tend to work with the sort of middle to senior part of the market. Um, interesting that they say it's fixed, it's not fixed, nothing's ever fixed. <laughs> and I, I don't know quite the exchange rate between euro and pounds and how that compares, but 300 feels a little on the low side, 350, I would be thinking that's about right, um, yeah. pounds. Yeah. Well, also depends our, our, oh, yeah, our average is, is around 330 and that's across 60 people. Uh, at the top end, you're looking at people with maybe 11 to 19 years experience at 370. And then that, that for people who are over 20 years experience at 460 euro per day. So and then we have people above that. Clearly, there are outliers in, in every case. Some people are charging very, very low rates, but clearly they're, some of them are new to the market. And I know it's difficult for for people who are entering freelance world for the first time as to where to pitch your rates. But that, again, maybe is the subject of another discussion. Um, so it is, uh, but I, again, I think in answer to the question, there are no fixed rates. You know, I think people should be prepared to pay based on the level of experience, the, 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 the level of, of relevance, I suppose, and the level of commitment that you're going to give to a particular role or a particular project. Um, so all of those things have to be taken into account. And I think a lot of the, the advice that we give to freelance people is don't just automatically commit and get into this, oh, my rate is X, but I'm willing to negotiate on it. We hear that all of, all of the time. And it's kind of, is it no wonder that rates are being dragged down when people say that this is my rate, but I'm willing to negotiate. It's just such an awful way to begin a, a conversation with a client. You're almost apologizing uh, for what you think you should be charging or what, you, what your value actually is. Yeah. There was a period of time where I had to stop myself going, it's this, if that's all right. <laughs> and instead just go, it's this, and then shut up. Um, it's, it's a tough, it's, it's a bit of practice to get into it when you're new to it, but um, yeah. Um, I think it's worth, if you're into a long-term relationship with a client, that maybe your day rate might reduce, but it doesn't have to. There's no reason it should, because there are actually, we're in demand. Freelancers are in demand, and it's only going to go more that way. Uh, there's there's uh, a question from somebody who's working in PR, Anna. Um, again, any guidance on rates around um, what PR copywriters should be charging? Because, again, her experience is that people are constantly undercutting in the PR area. Really? Yeah. Gosh, that's interesting. Um, I would say go with the day rate that makes for you. Um, most 
gosh, you know what? I don't work a lot with, when you say PR copywriter, I'm confused. Are you pitching as well as doing the strategy or is it just the writing? Um, there might be a niche thing there that I'm not too aware of, but I would say your day rate doesn't need to be any different to you know the average or what you want it to be. Um, it does depend on your your audience, your target market, and um, maybe the way that, again, get a process, because it really can elevate the way you position yourself. Uh, there's a question, interesting question from Alistair, and he's asking about the uh, apparent inherent ageism that might uh, might apply in the case of, of freelancers. Uh, have you come across that at all? Ah, it's interesting, because the way you've shared your, the, the fees there, Peter, um, I've got people who are in their late 20s to late uh, late 30s charging 800 a day as a copywriter um, and they could say award winning in front of their name <laughs> but I'm more interested in the fact that they're B2B tech and experts and they're they're charging you know 800 a day so um, the ageism maybe uh, I know a lot of career changers who are coming along going you know in their 40s entering this they've definitely got more confidence because they probably have more responsibilities in terms of what they need to cover with their with their fees and maybe a little bit more commercial awareness um but yeah i think ageism is a thing we yet to stamp out so i'm sure it's it's pre prevalent <laughs> in lots of different yeah, well, places certainly when we look at, at the age break and I'm, I'm i'm matching age with experience here but as we go up the age scale as in the experience scale then people are charging more and i think that that absolutely goes with the territory that makes sense um, again, yes. a question in relation to probably around the pricing and the elements of the pricing. Would you set different levels if work includes, say, client presentation alongside creative development? Um, this fields level up from sending off work and no client interface. Sorry, that's from Judy. Um, yeah. So I, I think right. that again comes down to the scope of work, doesn't it? What, it what, does. what is it client asking it you to do? Yeah. Yeah, there's transactional work versus thinking work. Um, although you could argue there's a bit of think in everything that we do. Um, I would certainly, yeah, I think that's definitely worth exploring. Get your brief clear and get clear on what value it is about having you in the room and make them aware that actually me being in this role is um, it's worth doing. Very good. Uh, I know we're coming to the end, Helen. There's a couple of other little questions. Just the, the platforms, because, you know, some people regard us as a platform, but we're not Upwork, we're not Fiverr, and we make very much a lot of noise about that. You know, we're not here to commoditize the, the, the freelance market in any shape or form, if anything, the opposite. But just based on your own experience of maybe dealing with the freelance platforms or, you know, working with people who are using freelance platforms, uh, I know, look, freelance platforms have existed for some time, existed for a longer time than, than the indie list and uh, incredible as well. But mm. is there, you know, what, what's your view in, in relation to, to the big freelance platforms? You know, presumably uh, they have uh, a lot of attractiveness for people who are starting off, yeah. I think one of the things that is hardest to contend with is how global they are. And you're suddenly not in a ge your geographical marketplace is blown apart and you are competing with people who need to earn considerably different amounts to be surviving and surviving um i never gave them any time or attention at all in 2016 when i first hired people i went to fiverr and it was a disaster it was an absolute disaster and i i'm not going back and that's why i've done it in a very different way moving forward um so i wrote them off at that point thinking i wouldn't get talent there However, I know there are people doing really, really well on those platforms. It feels like it takes an awful lot of effort to get noticed. And it's almost a game in itself, which is a game I feel like you don't have to play when you're dealing with, with clients that you might find through LinkedIn or your network. Um, the other thing I would say, I did write them off, particularly Upwork and definitely Fiverr, but Upwork as well, until Microsoft engaged us through Upwork and that was a real eye-opener to me so a company like Microsoft to get on their suppliers list there ain't no way in hell Helen Double is going to make it on there but I can be engaged as a freelancer through Upwork now I didn't win the work through Upwork I won the work through network connections recommendations but that was really interesting to me and it made me pay attention to it now we're now part of the talent cloud for Microsoft so ever so, ever so often I'll get a notification through that a new job's come on however it comes through at 5 p.m on a Friday <laughs> 
when I'm not working. So my opportunity to respond to it is really small. And I still feel like I have to play a game to win that work because it's very faceless. So for me, I don't feel like it works, but I feel there's people are really making it work for them. I guess it depends on what you're up, what you want to do and how you want to spend your time and, and where you want to invest. Very good. Um, and I was just going to ask you, there's, a, there's some great comments coming in from people here. It's kind of hard to reach through them all, but um, there's, there's a great quote from uh, one of our panelists who quotes Alison Graves, who wrote the Freelancer Bible, which I'm reading at the moment. And it says, if your client doesn't take a sharp intake of breath, when you tell them your rate, you're not charging enough. Yes. <laughs> Somebody once said to me, you're expensive. And I said, yes, I am. And it was the most empowering moment of my life. And I want everyone to have those moments. Be expensive. <laughs> Uh, there's also a question from Michelle. She's asked, would the Indialist be willing to share the rate to help all freelancers get a true sense of their positioning and pricing? It's something that we've talked about quite a bit. I mean, clearly, we don't share on an individual basis. We're happy to have consultations with people along the way and advise people if they're pitching rates. Ultimately, it's up to the freelancers to decide themselves what their value is. And I think some of the, the tactics and recommendations that Helen has made here today uh, will certainly help each of you, I think, to relook. Even if you're an experienced freelancer, you've been doing it for a number of years, or you're brand new into the market, there's some really, really interesting uh, ways that Helen has recommended there. But look, it's something that we're looking at. And I think at cer a certain point, maybe when come around our, our first birthday or so, which is around July, uh, we might look at publishing just averages for different sectors and, and uh and for different disciplines, I think that might be useful. But look, we'll, we won't promise it, but we'll certainly look at it if, uh, if that helps. Helen, it's, uh, it's almost two o'clock. Um, is there anything else that you want to leave our freelancers with that you would uh, advise uh, to make them even more sexier to clients? <laughs> I would say have a little more confidence or have confidence in your worth. Um, it is you are worth more than you're being paid right now. And there are people out there who are willing to pay you for that worth and that value. Um, and I also want to say, Peter, thank you so much for inviting me along. And I love what the Indie List stands for and what it's doing. I think it is a really beautiful creation. So thank you for creating it. Thank you for having me here today.